So yes, as Matt said, um, I'm Matt Dendle. I'm uh, uh, engineering team lead um, in the cloud infrastructure department at the DVLA. And uh, I'm going to talk today about um, how we uh, centralize all our logs because we've uh, we've got several compute environments and um, we wanted to all have the logs come back to the same pane of glass. Uh, I must apologize for my slides. I gave this talk before um, at an Elastic conference, so it might look like an Elastic salesman. I'm not. Um, this is just reusing the same slide deck because I'm really efficient and not lazy at all. So um, my Twitter handle is there at the bottom of the screen. Um, but if you do have any questions as you're going through, uh, as I'm going through, sorry, um, you can uh, you can visit this URL at the top of the screen. I'm going to, I'm going to quickly um, copy that link and paste it into chat so you guys can uh, ask questions as you go. Oops, sorry, one second. So um, if you just uh, Ask questions uh, as I'm going through, as the uh, as the need arises, and then I'll choose some questions at the end to uh, answer. I'll choose the ones that I can answer and ignore the ones that are too complicated for me. So, um, yeah. But further ado, I'll get started. Um, here's what I wanted to talk about. Um, just five areas. Uh, first of all, a very very brief introduction um, to the DVLA. Um, we're based in Swansea, so. I know I work with a few of you, so I know a few of you don't need to hear it. I know you know what we do, but um, there's some there's something I want to talk about the the amount of change we've been through as an organisation in recent years and what that's actually meant um, for our current strategies and how we're moving forward. Uh, then I want to talk about Kubernetes. Um, one of our platforms for our, our application workloads um, runs on Kubernetes, uh, so how we log there. Then I'm going to move on to serverless and. Um, how we log our serverless workloads uh, because um, quite a lot of our applications are going to be uh, using serverless, so some of them are already. And then um, it says key learnings is the fourth part, but basically the fourth part is I think one of the most valuable parts of the talk is the things that we've done that went wrong. Um, I think we can share um, a, lo a lot of useful stuff with people who are looking to use uh, the Elastic Stack while they're uh, logging. And um, yeah, it'd be uh, fun to listen to all the ways that we um, that we run into problems. And then lastly, I just want to talk about um, where we currently are with our ambitions and then what our future aims are. Um, okay, so the DVLA, um, I ripped this off uh, straight off Matt Lewis's talk um, in Las Vegas, but the DVLA's uh, goal is to get the right drivers and vehicles taxed and on the road as simply, safely, and efficiently as possible. Um, so that's what we're here to do. Uh, we were established in 1965, and that's the reason why we were established. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about other numbers, but just three numbers about the DVLA. Again, lifted off Matt Lewis's presentation. 43 million vehicle records we look after. We were responsible for the accuracy of those records. The same for um, the accuracy of the driver's records. You've got 49 million of those. And we're responsible for about 9 billion of revenue across all of our services. Um, so a quick bit of insight is if you've got 43 million vehicles and 49 million drivers, that means you've got 6 million backseat drivers. So um, that could explain a few of the arguments that, uh, that people have about backseat drivers. Um, but yeah, uh, we've been uh, growing uh, since we were founded, but our legacy systems have also grown organically over the last 20 odd years. And um, that's kind of led to where we are now, um, but we've got lots of we, we had a big change um, recently uh, in our in our history where um, in October 2015 we stopped um, a contract called Pact. The Pact came to an end. So, what was Pact? Pact was basically an agreement with um, outsourced uh, companies uh, where the DVLA didn't handle their own IT internally. They they uh, they outsourced it to companies like IBM and Fujitsu and what have you. And that contract was worth about 230 million. Um, and in October 2015, that came to an end. So that was when the DVLA transferred in people from both IBM and Fujitsu and other, other suppliers and brought the talent in-house so we could deliver that, um, deliver that capability ourselves. And that's obviously a massive transition. Um, so it, it was a big undertaking, a lot of negotiations with contracts and suppliers and what have you, but we got a lot of help from the GDS and the commercial crown services. But um, what that meant in bringing all these people together was that um, we, over the past few years, have been going through various programs of change. Uh, each program uh, slowly moving closer to um, the cloud first as it is now, the cloud first mentality where we consider the cloud first. So that's kind of the, one of the major changes um, in recent times that we've, um, that we've had, and it's had some knock-on effects. So currently, this is where our compute uh, 
lives. This is where Compute runs. Um, there are a couple of other places, but this is the main place. These are the main four platforms. We've got IBM Cloud, where some of our older stuff runs uh, on like main mainframes. Um, we obviously have AWS. Uh, we have some stuff running in Azure as well. And obviously, our logo is down there because we do have data centers that we uh, operate ourselves. So these are the four main domains that our um, our workloads run in. But um, uh, over the past few years, as I said, we've had different levels of evolution where we're slowly moving towards this goal. And we didn't get it right first time. Um, as, rare, as rarely you do with some with some strategies, but um, we decided uh, recently that we needed to adopt um, a new pattern um, in order to make new applications easier, um, make it easier for new applications to talk to existing applications in data stores. So we wanted to design an environment which had good um, good principles at its heart that made sure that the probability of success was as max was at a maximum, and that was called the uh, Open Services Landscape or the OSL. Um, I've just shown you a slide here. I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but here's some of the core concepts and principles and patterns that we wanted to adopt when we're looking at the Open Services Landscape. And uh, th this is this is this was our goal: is to get. Um, to get these concepts and principles embedded into a new uh, a new program of exchange where applications would be migrated or moved or be written newly on the open services landscape and they'd adopt uh, these uh, these core tenets here so that was this is what the um this is where we currently are is implementing this open services landscape and how it looks on the ground is um basically like this we've got a lot of ec2 instances um which are shown here i don't know what the water tap is uh, that was just one of the logos i used um these ec2 instances or these virtual machines wherever they are the task was to move these applications onto the open services landscape and what that actually looks like is it's either going to be uh, aws lambda here or it's going to be uh, kubernetes those are the two flavors of platforms that osl apps will be written in or written on so that was our task we needed to um split all of our development workforce into app squads and then each one of these app squads would be tasked with moving their particular app onto our osl platform and one of the main reasons why we've got a platform is so that when the application squads do move their app on they don't need to worry about login you don't need to worry about monitoring um security well obviously to worry about security but not not the platform level security we've got standards baked in so that they've got a framework to work in rather than design that will reinvent the wheel every time and um another key part was uh the cloud engineering department i'm in we didn't want to become a bottleneck for requests from all the different app squads to provision resources we wanted a good degree of self-service and um, some of the technologies we're going to talk about um, enable that. But basically, the things that um, we're using to uh, uh, to help us on the self-service aim are things like drones, Spinnaker, and uh, the serverless framework as well. But we'll um, we'll be focusing on logging for that for this talk. So yeah, as you can see underneath the platform here, um, we use uh, Elasticsearch, uh, the Elastic Stack. We've got Elasticsearch log, Elasticsearch Logstash, and Kibana there. And these separate things called Beats. Um, Beats are like lightweight data shippers. They are, they are agents that run on machines and they send data to um, normally through Logstash to Elasticsearch for analysis and what have you. So uh, yeah, the reason the platform exists is because application squads move applications up the platform and they get a load of stuff for free. They get logging, alerting and monitoring and it's uh, it's it's really helps them speed up their time to deployment and time to get value out of what they're doing. So um, yeah, that's stuff about the background. Um, the first platform I wanted to go into detail about is Kubernetes. Um, and yeah, this is how we log stuff, uh, log our applications that run on our Kubernetes part of the platform. Um, this diagram is a high level overview of how we do it. Um, on the left there, you can see we've got the Kubernetes logo. Um, hopefully, a few of you are uh, familiar with Kubernetes. If not, it's a container orchestration platform where applications are containerized and they're just chucked into Kubernetes and Kubernetes manages the life cycle of them, um, auto healing, things like that. Um, and what we've got here, um, what we've got here listing to the logs of each one of those containers that are running Kubernetes is a file beat. These little files here represent a file beat instance running on a node. A node is a Kubernetes um, cluster machine. 
And each one of those file bits then talks to, uh, sends their data to a central uh, log stash um, uh, service we've got here. And this central log stash service is what is what we um, use to modify the data. We might enrich it with some extra data. We might drop some fields. Um, and we also tag it to go to one of um, several of four outputs we've got here. Um, so when a log comes in uh, from file B to get sent to Logstash, and then Logstash runs these pipelines, which decide um, decide what to do with the data, what amendments to make, what fields to add, what have you, and then sends to these outputs. This one here is Elasticsearch. This is where the data is stored for future analysis, trend analysis, machine learning, and what have you. That's here. Uh, maybe we've got an internal MIBI project at the DVLA. Some events need to be routed through to that. That's what happens there. Uh, here we've got a BMC um, uh, agent, which is um, our old, uh, well, our old, our current mo logging, um, our current monitoring infrastructure. But um, you'll see here there actually is a separate Logstash instance as well. Um, so we basically got a Logstash, log, Logstash connection there, um, and that's not really recommended by Elastic. But we'll go into more detail as to uh, why that can become a problem. But that's BMC. And then lastly, we've got the current scene tool that we're using called Logwithm. We need to send security events through to that uh, to that thing as well. And that all comes through this Logstash pipeline here. Um, so we currently write, um, when uh, we don't want to set up uh, a, a separate logging um, index in Elasticsearch, uh, an index in Elasticsearch, by the way, is where you store data. We don't want to have to set one of them up every time a new application joins the platform. So what we've done is we've, uh, these, uh, this pipeline automatically routes these logs through to the correct index in Elasticsearch based on the, um, the namespace, the Kubernetes namespace that, that pod is in. So if you imagine we've got a load of app squads, each app squad kind of has their own namespace. So everything's nice and uh, isolated and the logs come through like that. So um, we currently use the pod namespace as the index name and Logstash does that for us. But um, we needed to also use a feature in Elasticsearch called uh, rollover indices um, because we weren't able to predict how much logging data a particular app might use. We needed to use this feature so that Elasticsearch could automatically provision new indices with a 50 gig limit so that one index didn't fill up and dominate the hard disk of one particular node. So we had to do a little bit of uh, jiggery pokery. We had to go and uh, create this uh, application that was running inside Kubernetes, looking at new namespaces. So when a new namespace appeared, uh, this namespace scanner would configure Elasticsearch to use this rollover indice feature. Uh, and that would happen alongside the event coming through um, from Logstash. So um, as soon as a new application is deployed, it's deployed into a namespace, the namespace gets created. The namespace scanner then picks up that fact and then configures Elasticsearch ready to receive the logs. So um, yeah, uh, we also had to um, reject, uh, by default, sorry, or Elasticsearch automatically creates indices um, based on the incoming event. So we had to turn that off. Otherwise, you'd have a race condition. It would either get uh, the namespace scanner getting there first and creating the index, or the event coming from Logstash creating the index. So we had to turn that feature off. It's just uh, an, an interesting note to get there. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically how it works. Um, when uh, when a pod writes an event, it gets written to the local um, container run drive, the container runtime login driver, which is like a JSON file-based one. And then FileBeat picks it up, sends it to Logstash, and then Logstash forwards it on to search and then those other outputs that we saw earlier. So yeah, that covers it off. Um, next then is serverless. As I said, some of the applications that we've got on our open services landscape run on the Kubernetes side, and then some of it runs on serverless. So next is the serverless and how we do that. So very basic diagram. Um, so this is the simple way. Uh, you've got your workload app here, which will be your app driven business value actually running your workload. And then you've got, um, uh, the logs that get written to AWS uh, CloudWatch log group, and that happens automatically. Uh, and what we need to do then to get it into our central solution is we need to subscribe a Lambda to that CloudWatch log group in order to forward it on to Logstash and therefore Elasticsearch and the other outputs. Because obviously we still need to grab the, um, the output for the log, uh, for, the, um, for the Lambda function, the workload app. So yeah, this is fine. Um, this is the way, uh, this, this way is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Apart from there's a scaling problem because um, this workload app here for every, for every event that that emits to CloudWatch, the CloudWatch log group, a logging Lambda will be invoked for each event. So if you imagine you've got a very busy workload app there 
um, and that's and it's generating a lot of events. You could actually get into a situation where you run into uh, logging lambda resource limits. There's a reason. There's a there's a region limit for the number of um, it's changeable by by a support, but there's a regional limit that you have uh, somewhere about a thousand, I think, by default. And um, what that would mean is, if your application generated more than a thousand or more than this limit you may run the risk of losing logs because the associated log in Lambda wouldn't be able to uh, be executed in order to dispatch that, uh, the event to log stash. So uh, what do you do? Uh, well, there's a great blog by a chap called Jan Kui, who's a, an AWS serverless data hero. Uh, the blog is called Centralized Logging for AWS Lambda. And um, it's, uh, it's a great blog. I thoroughly recommend you read that for the detail about what I'm talking about here. But basically, um, what I suggested is adding Kinesis data streams uh, or a Kinesis data stream into the middle of the works. So I'll just go through what this changes and, uh, and how it's different. So from the worker app on the left, everything's the same. It still logs to a log group in CloudWatch, and nothing changes from there. The difference is it doesn't go straight to the log in Lambda from here. It actually gets sent to a Kinesis data stream. Now, a Kinesis data stream is split into shards, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the shard and its associated logging Lambda. So basically, you can control the volume of con concurrently running Lambdas by the number of shards. If you've got two shards in a Kinesis data stream, you'll have two Lambdas invoked. And each one of those lambdas runs through each event in its shard serially, so there's no danger of um, missing uh, missing logs. Having said that, there are some throughput uh, limits on each Kinesis data stream shard, um, so you need to be careful of that. But this is a much more reliable way of controlling those concurrent invocations and making sure that you deal with the peaks and troughs in a in a reasonable way that you that you don't lose any data, and from then on, that log in Lambda is exactly the same. It logs onto Logstash. So yes, uh, I thoroughly recommend you read that blog. It's called um, Containerized, uh, sorry, Centralized Logging for AWS Lambda. Uh, again, we didn't want to have to set up this infrastructure for every app that's deployed. So um, we did also um, in we did also set up uh, this um, solution whereby we have uh, two lambdas that perform some automated tasks when a new log group is created. So as the, as the diagram shows here, we tap into events in AWS CloudTrail. We tap into the new log group created event. And when that event uh, is detected, two lambdas are invoked. The first lambda here, it sets a retention period to the log group for seven days. So you're not keeping logs in there necessarily. We're going to be storing them in Elasticsearch. There's no need to store them here. And then secondly, we subscribe that log group to that Kinesis data stream, uh, stream that, we store, uh, that we saw in the last slide in the middle there. So with this infrastructure deployed into the account, any new Lambda that, that gets created automatically creates a new log group, and that in turn automatically fires off these two Lambdas. So we've got a nice automated way of getting all the logs in one place. And yeah, that's how we do it in Lambda. Um, and then the fun part, the things that went wrong, key learnings. Um, if you remember the start of the talk, I showed this diagram, um, and this one's got a new title. It's called Missing Data. So after a, pipe, um, a pipeline interruption, some events were missing. So I want to talk through what happened, and hopefully then, if this ever happens to you, you'll know what happened, and you can avoid this problem in the future. So I'll start with describing what went wrong, and then how we fixed it. So remember I mentioned this log stash to log stash link here is a bit sketchy. So we went through um, consultancy with Elastic, and uh, they highlighted this as a potential issue. Um, Logstash can be a bit flaky when it's talking to um, another Logstash instance because if this Logstash instance here, because of the way the plugin works, if this Logstash instance here is unavailable, even for a moment, this Logstash instance here stops running that event. It stops running that event. It stops running the pipeline that processes all the events. This thing just stops. So this happened. One time this happened, we had to do a patch on this BMC box. Logstash didn't wake back, wake back up on the right port, or there was a problem with the target group. I can't remember which it was. But this wasn't available, which meant this had a this had a fit, which meant this wasn't available to the filebeat pods that were running in Kubernetes. Now, that, normally, that's fine, right? Normally, filebeat offers a guaranteed message delivery. They say that if I have not received um, a Logstash OK, which only rep reports back if the upstream is OK as well, I'm going to remember the last... I'm going to remember for each file, the location of that file and the offset within that file that I last sent a log from. So that's that's fine. 
you're going to be able to hang on to those logs. And as soon as uh, this guy becomes uh, comes back up, those logs are going to come back through. And that's what happened in the, in the most case. Uh, this, this box was restored. We restarted the pipelines on here. And retrospectively, we saw events coming from file beat through logs dash to, um, to all these outputs here in, into uh, the search and maybe what have you. For the most part, for most applications, that was happening. Apart from, funnily enough, our busiest applications. Our busiest applications, we noticed that they were not restoring events. We were losing these events. If the outage lasts an hour, there was a miss, there was a gap in, in the logs for an hour. And that was obviously not good. So you were thinking, well, wh where's the data going? Filebeat offers guaranteed message delivery. So any message that wasn't sent there before is obviously going to be sent there when Logstash wakes back up. Uh, so unfortunately, we missed something. It's the fact that inside Kubernetes, um, the container runtime has a logging driver. And that logging driver has default settings for log file rotation. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. What was happening is during the outage, let's say this um, this was down for 10 minutes. During the outage, um, the container runtime was still logging stuff as normal, persisted to disk locally. But the logging driver was configured to make sure the disk didn't run out of space by rotating log files out of action. So what was happening is that every 10 to 50 meg um, that a log file is filling up to on the actual Kubernetes nodes, it was decommissioning that log file and swapping in a new one. So the file beat registry of last of guaranteed message delivery was pumped into files that were subsequently deleted, which meant that those that data was rotated out and lost. So um, that's what the problem was. We uh, we got stuck on uh, we got stuck on the fact that we thought file beat was guaranteed message delivery, but obviously there's this log rotate um, deal happening underneath. So what we did to buy us some time was to change the logging drivers options so that we um, we equated that we probably need about four hours at least up to a day to respond to some types of issues. So we chose a file size that meant for the um, for the nodes that we had, um, we'd have some time, we'd have a, a good, deal, good deal more time to deal with the, um, the, the issue and get things back up and running before data was lost. So that was done, uh, incidentally, this was on a COPS cluster, so we had to edit the COPS config uh, to do this. And um, that's what bought us more time. But again, this is just a sticky plaster. This is not the way to um, to fix it permanently. This is just buys us more time. The best way to do it is to introduce Kafka queues in between your file beat um, instances and log stash. So then in that Kafka queue, you can do the same kind of thing where you can store up a buffer of data to give you to give yourself more time to um, respond to the underlying event and get logs flowing as normal. So yeah, that's the first case. Is um, is that's that's the case of missing data. Um, so the next issue that we had, I'm um, going to talk about this, is too many shards. So uh, we had some performance issues on our cluster. wasn't performing very well. We were spending money on having to scale up a bit sooner than we should. Um, in the consultancy session, we realized that what our problem was, we had too many shards. Elasticsearch say, um, so sorry, a shard, for those of you who don't know, uh, in Elasticsearch, data is stored in indices. So one app, one app's logs would go to an index, and that index is split into shards, so they can be distributed amongst all the nodes that, come, that that make up a cluster. So these shards, it's only worth having them if they're around the 50 gig mark. You don't want to have a lot of shards lying around around the 100k, 200k mark. It's not worth it. It's not worth the resources of the system to keep that thing going. So that's what Elasticsearch told us. They said, you know what, will really help if you get those shards down to a reasonable amount. If you, if you lose a good proportion of these shards, that would be a good thing. So um, we, through consultancy and uh, through some development effort, we made it so that um, whenever a new application was being created, they wouldn't have the default of five shards and five replicas. They'd have one shard. They don't, all their data would get written into one of these little shards there, uh, and that was great. I mean, really, we were really happy with ourselves. They use a picture of us high-fiving because we were so happy with ourselves after achieving this goal. It was brilliant. We, some people came in wearing shades. It really got our hand. We were very happy. Um, until the next slide. So this next slide, slide is called Too Few Shards, or the cessation of high-fives and introduction of rollover indices. So how could we have too few shards? What happened? Well, basically... Um, one of the app squads um, deployed their app with the most verbose login level that you could. That's fine. That's not a problem. We can deal with that. What we couldn't deal with is the fact that they then went on to performance test it. So 
we do twice peak load for our performance testing over a substantial amount of time. And that absolutely smashed one of these shards with all of the data. We're talking gigs in minutes. So um, what that meant was, because it's one shard, it can only be it can only live on one hard disk. That hard disk filled up pretty quickly and then started having a catastrophic effect on the rest of our cluster. And the answer to this was the rollover indices that I talked about in the first uh, in the first slides. Um, so rollover indices, what they do again for a recap, is when Logstash writes to Elasticsearch, it doesn't write directly to an index, it writes to an alias. And then behind the scenes, Elasticsearch plunks that alias at first one index, when that gets full, the next index, and when that gets full, the next, and so on. So it's a great way to not have to decide upfront how many shards you need, because you can't change it. In Elasticsearch, when you create an index, you decide the amount of shards upfront, and that's it. If you need to, if you do anything else with that index, you need to use um, some fancy API to resize it. You can't dynamically reshard uh, re these things. So this is why rollover indices are great. You don't have to predict how many shards you need up front, and each each app's um, index can respond differently based on their particular velocity of logs. So it's a really great tool. I recommend that you start off using this rollover indices feature if you're uh, if you're thinking about using logs dash uh, Elasticsearch for your centralized login solution. And um, one last tip about things um, is Cerebro. Um, this is an Elasticsearch uh, monitoring and admin tool. Um, it doesn't look like much there, but basically what this allows you to do is um, see where the data lives. If I just show you my pointer there, you can see these are shards. This is a primary copy of a shard, and this is a replica for redundancy. And you can see across all the data in your cluster where the data lives. And what that means is um, it really does help with restarts as well, because most scripts allow you to uh, restart a node and then wait till the cluster goes back into green state before you can go on to the next one. But with this tool, you can really accelerate that and turn a five-day upgrade into a couple of hours. It's really good. So yeah, lastly then, just quickly, I want to cover off um, what a current position is, because you haven't fully realized this goal yet. Um, but right now, our squads do manage their own releases, so the self-service thing's working well. Um, new application logs do automatically appear. That's great. And inside the Elk stack, there's um, a service called Kibana, where, um, where you can visualize the data we've got in search. It's a great analysis tool. And it's also where you can control and manage the machine learning aspect and things like that. Very powerful tools. Um, there's one last thing missing. Remember I said at the start about um, they might need some of the extra things provisioned. Well, we've got a self-service portal in the in the pipeline in the in the works to get um, to get that bit covered off, so that we so that we're giving self-service as much as we can, so that the application squads aren't relying on us and we're not a centralized like congestion point for work uh, being delivered. Um, just a quick example of a couple of dashboards. Um, this is a dashboard that you get if you turn on Seam, which is Elastic Searches or Elastics. Um, security and uh, incident and event monitoring system. This shows um, some dashboards. It's not particularly pretty, um, but this shows the, uh, the kind of visualizations you can do. And then I just want a quick example of one of the app squad's dashboards that, that they've made. Um, again, it's not going to win any beauty awards, um, but it's very functional. Uh, and the application squad's in control of this themselves, so they can get to the data that they really want to get to. Um, and, it's, um, and it's of great value to them. Um, and then lastly, uh, just to talk about what we're going to do in the future, I mentioned Seam. We're going to be looking at rolling that out um, for or across the um, across at least the Kubernetes side and any other EC2 instances you might have. And um, hopefully we'll have um, we'll have that um, we've got it up and running on some of our box at the moment. We're going to get that rolled out. And then there's a new licensing model called uh, ECE, um, which is um, uh, it's going to make things a lot easier. But it also comes with a new feature, um, which is Elastic Endpoint. Uh, for those cybersecurity people out there, Elastic recently acquired a company called Endgame, and they're baking that into their product. So now, because um, Endgame is using Elastic uh, Search as its uh, data repository anyway, uh, which means uh, Endgame is a big deal. They're used by um, mostly the Ministry of Defense in the USA, so the Army, Navy, um, NASA, and things like that. They use that as an endpoint security, so the security on laptops and on their servers. So you get that for free with um, Elastic ECE. So we're looking to be using that over the next uh, months, maybe um, maybe a bit longer, but the rollout is um, is uh, is coming soon. So uh, that's all I've got. Um, that's all I've got to say, really. Um, if you do have uh, any um, any questions, uh, you can use that link that I said um, that I sent out earlier on. I'll go through that now. But um, I hope you found some value in what I've had to say today, and thank you very much for listening. 
Um, I will have a quick look at the list of questions um, that we've got here. Um, I'll have a quick look. So I've got a question here from uh, Will Embry. Uh, is the new DVLA beta API an early example of an OSL-based app? Um, if it's a new DVLA beta API, then I imagine it would be. I think this particular one is serverless, but I'm not the best person to ask. I think, actually, Matt Lewis might be a better person to answer this particular question than me. Matt, are you there, mate? Can you answer this question? Well, I, I didn't really want to steal your thunder, Matt. Oh, well, I, I've got no thunder, mate. I'm out of thunder. I, this, I, I, I'm pretty sure this is, but I didn't want to say that 100% gospel because um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, ultimately, OSL is just an acronym, and it was just a way that we're trying to distinguish between um, things like where we had services deployed onto either a mainframe that we ran or we also operate two crown commercial data centers. So you're kind of thinking you're, you're actually procuring physical servers, racking them, you know, still virtualizing them, but effectively running things in, in physical data centers. So now as part of the sort of central government, we're, we're part of this sort of cloud first mandate. And so we define that as a new platform, as a as a new technology stack. So where we're exposing our things like beta APIs that have gone live, it's very much using things like API Gateway, Cognito, Lambda. Um, so yeah, a lot yeah. of our sort of inquiry APIs use use serverless platform. Uh, and we also have a Kubernetes platform, which which Matt talked about earlier in terms of, you know, we, we actually have you know a tooling platform using EKS. We've historically used COPS. Um, so, you know, I think yeah. it's a combination of both containers and, and serverless. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, so there's another question. I hope that answers your question there. Well, uh, I've got another question here. Um, are you looking to use FluentD rather than FileBeats for your getting logs out of your Kubernetes environment? So, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, FileBeat, um, FileBeat's working great for COPS. But um, I think I mentioned in one of the earlier slides that one of the technologies we're going to be using, or we are using, but we're going to be using more wholesale is um, uh, EKS, the AWS Managed um, Kubernetes Service. So I think that's got a tighter integration with CloudWatch. This is an interesting point, is that we don't know exactly what we're going to do with the, um, with the uh, EKS-based Kubernetes clusters. Is it worth putting FileBeat, uh, FileBeat daemon set on that? I don't know because it, it, ha it enjoys tighter coupling with um, CloudWatch than uh, an out-of-the-box COPS cluster would. So maybe we'll use Fluentd there, or maybe we'll use the CloudWatch integration. But uh, at the moment, no, we, we're, not, we're not looking to use Fluentd particularly. If we do move to anything, I reckon it would be this EKS CloudWatch thing. But um, that, that's, that's up in the air. We'll probably get to that when, when more workload moves over to this EKS offering. Um, so yeah, that's all the questions. Uh, thanks for those questions. Good questions. And um, yeah, thanks for your time, everyone. Cheers.